As you may know, one of the most important topics that we cover here on the Relationship Alive podcast, because it makes such a difference in the success of a relationship, is how to improve communication. So I just put together a free guide for you with my top three communication secrets to reduce conflict and increase connection and understanding in your relationship. Once you put these three things into action, it will make a huge difference in your relationship, even if your partner isn't doing anything differently. To get it, all you have to do is visit neilsatin.com slash relate, or simply text the word relate to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. And now, on with the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Relationship Alive. This is your host, Neil Satin. On the show, we've had a number of guests who have talked about all sorts of ways to improve your relationship, whether it be better sex, how to get over infidelity, how to heal after an argument, and no person has had perhaps a greater influence on the field today of what we know about what makes relationships work and what doesn't than today's guest, John Gottman. John is the author of The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work, which is a New York Times bestseller. Also, uh, What Makes Love Last, How to Build Trust and Avoid Betrayal. And most recently, along with his wife, Julie, and uh, Doug and Rachel Abrams, The Man's Guide to Women, which is a, a fun read as well. We're going to cover a lot of ground in today's episode, and as usual, we will have detailed show notes that you can download. On top of that, John has generously offered again his Dreams in Conflict exercise free for you to download. So to get that, all you have to do is visit neilsatin.com slash gotman2, that's the number two, so G-O-T-T-M-A-N-2. Or you can simply text the word passion to the number 33444 and follow the instructions and I will send you a link where you can download the show guide, the, the exercise, and also all of the other show guides from the Relationship Alive podcast. So John has was the very first guest on the Relationship Alive podcast, and uh, it is an honor to have you back here on the show to do a Masterclass in Relationship Part 2. So thank you so much for being here with us today, John. I'm glad to be here, Neil. Well, let's get right to the meat of the matter. And a topic that's come up many times here on the podcast is this question of how do you build safety in your relationship and, and how, why safety itself is such a bedrock for having an amazing, thriving relationship. So I'm wondering if you can talk for a moment about the science of trust. And I know you've written a whole book on the science of trust. And uh, so we're not going to cover the whole thing right now, but um, I'd love to get into some of the finer points of why trust is so important. And, and maybe if you have a few like, oh, here's something you might not really have guessed about what builds trust in relationship. Maybe that's a good place to start with sort of a surprise for, for um, a trust builder between partners in relationship. Yeah, I you know, there's no question that, you know, trust is absolutely important. In our in our sound relationship house theory, our little mighty theory that Julie and I developed, uh, based on the research that I've been doing for the past 40 years, um, we find that trust is absolutely essential for building this safety in relationship. And it's very important to think about how we define trust. And we use the mathematics of game theory to to do that, to accomplish that, to be able to really evaluate and measure trust in the laboratory and any, any interaction that a couple has. And the definition of trust is really that your partner and you are thinking of both benefits, not only your own benefits, but your partner's benefits. So if you know that your partner is not only thinking about 
her welfare or his welfare, but your own welfare as well. And trying to maximize the sum of any gains that happen in a relationship, any decision that gets made, they're thinking of what you need as well as what they need. And then that's what trust is. That, that's what we call a high trust metric. And if that exists in a relationship, it turns out that when people disagree, they really are not disagreeing with an adversary. They're disagreeing with their friend who has their interests at heart as well. So that cooperation is really increased. And you wind up getting what's called the Nash equilibrium um, in any interaction, which means that nobody can do any better by changing their position. It's really the relationship is the maximum cooperation and efficiency. So it's logical. People are really able to talk about problems and really work together to solve problems as they arise. So I'm going to ask you a, a low trust sort of question, which is um, the what happens when like I'm listening to you and I'm thinking that sounds great. Like I I really want to think that my partner and I are um, have each other's best interests in mind as we move forward in our decision making and yeah, how we make choices about life. But I'm I'm afraid, and I'm I'm not I'm not really because it's not like this in my relationship. But I'm I'm imagining someone listening, thinking, what if that becomes kind of one sided? Like, yeah, sure, I can have my partner's interests at, at heart, but I don't know that they'll always have mine. And in fact. I might, how do I avoid becoming a doormat for my partner in, in this approach? Especially if, they're, if my partner isn't terribly active in thinking about the relationship. Well, here's what we, what we discovered. The way that couples build trust naturally is by listening to their partner's negative emotions. Listening to their partner when their partner is sad, uh, disappointed, feelings get hurt, they're angry, uh, either about things outside the relationship, but especially, you know, if my wife is disappointed in me, I've hurt her feelings, she's angry with me, the ability to listen without getting defensive, to really take in what my partner is feeling rather than dismissing those emotions and saying, go away. I don't want to hear your negative emotions. The ability to really respond is what builds the trust metric. So there's a way of systematically building it if there's a problem with trust. You can teach people this skill that we call attunement, which is a special kind of listening. And it's, you know, it's a listening not to rebut your partner's position, not to argue against your partner, but to see things from your partner's perspective with a sense of compassion and empathy. And if that skill of attunement is working, then trust really builds over time. And the major thing that all new relationships argue about is, can I trust you? Will you be there for me? Do you have my back? And all kinds of arguments proceed around that. And 130 newlywed couples that we studied for six years, that's the major thing that couples argue about. And attunement is the way to build it. So if it feels like trust is slipping, it's really about this skill of mutually listening to one another that builds the trust metric. And so that makes a ton of sense to me. And what I'm wondering is if you could touch on the the last part of the question around couples where, and of course this happens all the time, right? Where one of the partners is really interested in, you know, the betterment of the relationship and the mm -hmm. other thinks things are great, but, you know, isn't aware necessarily of um, perhaps their negative impact. So if I'm the partner who's doing a lot of great attuning to my partner's negative emotions, but they never seem to really want to attune to mine, what would you suggest for that person? It doesn't work if, if it's one-sided. You know, there, psychologists have actually studied relationships. In the 1980s, there were a lot of people studying relationships where usually the woman was very depressed and very irritable. And she was married, she was happily married. And she was generally ma married to a guy who really did this kind of listening and attuning where she didn't at all. And her kids also wound up being very supportive when she was depressed. 
And those relationships worked. So there is some evidence that relationships where an asymmetry exists, where one partner is doing all the emotional work, can actually work. But it's a very special person you have to select. It's somebody who's very open-minded and very agreeable and very conscientious about, you know, sticking with working on that relationship, doing the relationship work. And, you know, a, another example of that kind of asymmetry may surprise you. Um, there's an, there are these journals coming out now, memoirs of people, mar women married to guys who have Asperger's. And they really have no ability to listen to emotions. And there was one case of, of this memoir where this woman was very depressed and she liked the fact that her husband was just totally logical. He was a complete Vulcan. And, you know, he listened, but he didn't respond to the emotions. He wasn't affected by them. And the guy had transcranial magnetic stimulation. And suddenly he was able to read emotion and the marriage fell apart. <laughs> and the symmetry didn't work. When he started becoming, you know, sensitive and understanding, you know, she hated it because now he was responding to her emotions and she didn't want him to respond to her emotions. So asymmetries are really interesting and they do exist and it can happen. But the overwhelming majority of relationships require a symmetry in listening rather than an asymmetry. Yeah. And I imagine that a partner who doesn't feel like they're being heard might at least be able to offer their their partner or their spouse some guidance. Like, like if they know the art of listening really well, then they might say, hey, like instead of I mean, it's going to take a, a huge level of emotional um, stability on that person's part, probably to be able to do it. But to in the moment say, you know, what? it would really be really great if you just looked into my eyes right now and nodded or reflected back to me what you're hearing and that sort of thing. Yeah, those kinds of very specific suggestions really do go a long way. But I want to tell you that research shows that trust is not adequate to build this safety in relationships. It requires a second thing, which is commitment. And the great research of a woman named Carol Rusbolt, Carol Rusbolt, R-U-S-B-U-L-T, a brilliant social psychologist who unfortunately died at the age of 51. But for 30 years, she did research on defining, also using game theory, defining commitment. And commitment is absolutely necessary for building safety in a relationship. And it's not the same as trust because commitment is really saying, you are my journey. I have chosen you and I cherish what I have with you. And couples who don't build that kind of commitment and that kind of investment in a relationship, who aren't 100 percent in the relationship, who make negative comparisons to real or imagined other relationships when things go bad in their relationship. In other words, when they have a big fight, they're saying, I can do better. You know, who needs this crap with this person? I can do better. Either imagining or, or going to another relationship. Those people really uh, wind up betraying the relationship. Carol Rusball's research is the only research that can predict sexual infidelity. All the other research on sexual infidelity and betrayal goes from the event and ask people about the past. But she predicted it. And it's all about investing in the relationship and cherishing what you have and building gratitude for what you have rather than building resentment for what's missing in that relationship that creates commitment, that creates that ability to say, you know, the old wedding vow that, you know, the ancient one that said, I plight thee my troth, which really means You've got everything, baby. <laughs> Nothing to offer any other person. You know, you've got it all. Uh, that, that's what commitment's about. And Carol Rusbolt really showed us how to measure that, how to conceptualize it. And in the research I did using her work, combining it with the kind of, kind of measures that we get, observational measures, physiological measures, that's the secret to building 
a safe safety in the relationship. It's not just about trust. It's also about commitment. So, and commitment, how, how do you help people get to a deeper level of commitment? Because I imagine even people who are married to each other may not experience that deep level of commitment that you're describing. Yes, that's very insightful, Neil, because I have done therapy with couples who have, have children, have houses together, you know, have in many ways uh, intertwined their lives, but they are not committed. So when things start going wrong, you know, they start saying, hey, you know, you know, I can do better than this. And they're in their mind. They're thinking uh, when they're even when they're not together, they're thinking of other people. And they're giving themselves permission to cross boundaries, sometimes very innocently. And part of what we know about affairs is that they involve conflict avoidance, avoiding conflict and avoiding self-disclosure, avoiding saying to your partner, hey, baby, you know, since the baby came, you know, we haven't had sex. And, you know, and, you know, we don't even finish conversations. And I really miss you. You know, and I had this conversation with this lady at work at the Christmas party. And, you know, I realized I was having such a good time and we haven't talked like that in a long time. Let's change that. And what happens when you don't go to your partner with your needs, but you start thinking, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to avoid conflict because she'll get mad if I tell her that. And so, you know, I'll just, you know, I'll find somebody else to confide in. Uh I'll find somebody else to be close to. That's when commitment erodes. And Carol Rustball showed us that those negative comparisons are would begin the cascade toward betrayal instead of a cascade toward loyalty. Mm, so I'm imagining a helpful hint for someone if you find yourself making that sort of negative comparison or thinking like, all right, the... The grass has got to be greener elsewhere or so-and-so actually seems to really pay attention to me or find me attractive or, you know, I'm sure I could have sex with so-and-so if, if I pursued that. Like, so when you're going down that road, what should you do instead? Well, I think it requires awareness. You know, I really think it requires um, knowledge of what love really is because, you know, what we've discovered is that there are three phases of love in a lifetime of love. You know, a lot of times people say the reason relationships go bad is because people expect too much. So it's important to know what you can expect in a relationship. That initial phase of falling in love, for example, a lot of people say, well, you can't stay in love forever. I mean, how long can that last? It lasts 18 months at best. Well, Helen Fisher's research shows that you know, you can have couples, you know, you can put them in the functional MRI tube and show them uh, a picture of the person they say they're in love with and a stranger. They look at the picture of their stranger and nothing lights up in their brain's pleasure center. They look at somebody and they're, they're in love with their whole pleasure center lights up. The whole septal area of the brain lights up that secretes dopamine and, and experiences pleasure. And it doesn't last 18 months It'll, people who have been married 21 years, 30 years are still in love. So that's one phase, but it can last forever. And the second phase is building trust. And the third phase is building commitment. So what people need to do is be aware of how to love. And this building commitment is just exactly the opposite of pornography. In pornography, anybody will do. You can plug them in or out. You know, it's really not personal, but commitment is about loving that person. It's about saying, you know, baby, nobody on the planet can hold the candle to you. You're it for me. Nobody can compare to you. I want to make love to you. I want to be with you. That's what requires safety. So Jim Cohen's research, are you aware of that, Neil? A little bit, yeah, but if you want to dive in, that's great. Yeah, Jim Cohen puts people in a functional MRI tube and measures the fear center of the brain, the amygdalas. And, and he puts them in this functional MRI tube and there is an electrode on their big toe that gives them an electric shock. And 
when they see a blue circle, they're not going to get shocked. But when they see a red cross, there's a 25% chance they'll get an electric shock. That's uncomfortable. It doesn't really hurt, but it's really unpleasant. Well, they're either holding the hand of a stranger when they're in the tube or nobody's hand or they're holding the hand of somebody that they love. Right, right. And when they're holding the hand of somebody that, that they're in love with, you know, a really happy relationship, the whole fear center shuts down. Well, Jim Cohen did this research over and over again and got this effect. And then he started doing it with gay and lesbian couples. And here was a very strange thing he discovered. This is before the Supreme Court decision that allowed gay and lesbian couples to marry everywhere in the country. And he found that he only got the effect for gay and lesbian couples who considered themselves to be married, who were committed to one another. Then you got the whole fear center shutting down when they held hands with that person. If they weren't committed to one another, they got more fear reduction by holding a stranger's hand than their partner's hand. So there's a measure of, of the benefits of commitment. If you consider yourselves yourself committed to your partner, you get this soothing effect, um, that fear reduction effect that is mediated by the neurotransmitter, the hormone oxytocin that shuts down the fear system. And that's why there are so many benefits for committed relationships. Uh, people live longer, they're healthier, their kids do better, all kinds of wonderful benefits. Yeah, we've uh, covered on the podcast quite a bit this notion of behaviors that actually foster oxytocin in relationship for that very reason that it, you know, it has the pair bonding effect, but it also has that effect of contributing to your sense of safety. That's right. That's right. So cuddling is really a good thing. Yeah. And the, I guess the act of saying I do, even if it's only in your mind, uh, also is going to release the oxytocin floodgates. Well, it's not just saying I do. It's really, as Kara Russell showed, it, showed us, it's really investing in the relationship. Now, sometimes people tell me, you know, I ask, I get reporters asking me, you know, how many hours do you need in a week to invest in your relationship <laughs> to get away with it? You know, what, can you have a good relationship by just, you know, sending a couple of texts or you know, a couple of Facebook notes? Can you can you just text your partner twice a week and then it's good enough? And the answer really is that the time you do spend with your partner, it's got to involve 100 percent of your heart. And you've got to be really completely invested, willing to even sacrifice for your partner. And that sacrificing shows the commitment that, you know, trust is about your partner caring as much about your benefits as his own or her own. Commitment is about caring more about your partner's benefits than your own. It's about being willing to make those sacrifices. Mm, what I love about that way of describing the stages in relationship as well is the way it it illustrates that that trust is uh, in some ways a, a a precursor is is essential for having That's that right. level of commitment exactly yeah trust is the beginning and you know and of course you always are building trust you're you know you're letting your partner know you know that you're there for your partner, that you're, you're investing in the relationship. But commitment is, is really going the extra mile. It means that even when your partner is not with you, your partner is with you in your mind. And, you know, and you really are thinking in your mind. And this is, this is what Rustbelt showed us. You're thinking positive things about your partner's character and about the relationship. And, I'm, you know, I find myself walking around saying, boy, I'm one lucky guy to have Julie in my life. And I just, you know, sing her praises in my mind, even when she's not there. That's what Russ Balshara's commitment is about. Mm, yeah, I'm imagining having an app for your phone that, you know, goes off once every few hours. And when it goes off, it's your cue to think positive, appreciative thoughts about your partner. Right. To nurture gratitude for yeah. what you and to cherish your partner. Um, so, you know, that's something that, you know, 
a lot of people sort of take for granted and don't do, especially once they get into a relationship. Uh, the Sloan Center at UCLA, which studies couples' everyday kinds of relationships, found that very often young dual career couples, their life becomes this long to-do list and they hardly talk to each other during a week. You know, I, I talked to Tom Bradbury about this study because he was involved in, in this study of 30 dual career couples in Los Angeles. And he said that most couples talk to each other an average of 35 minutes a week. Oh, my word. Oh, my <laughs> word. Is about who's going to do what when, you know, and taking care of the kids and doing housework and doing errands rather than sitting down and, and connecting emotionally and just saying, how you doing, baby? How's the world treating you? What's on your mind? What's on your heart? I want to know. I'm listening. You're yeah. Too- in, in today's world, people tend to be busier and busier. I mean, I don't, I don't talk to a person at these days where when I ask them how they're doing, the first words that come out of their mouths are usually, well, busy, like busier than ever. And, yeah. you know, I'm included in that. Um, and so, and then I'm thinking also about couples where they're already busy and then, and yet somehow they're, they're making it work, but then they have a baby or they have young children. So that just adds like a ton of intensity and distraction and hopefully joy as well to the mix. And I'm wondering that's, that tends to be one of the most difficult and challenging stages in relationship is when young kids come in and and the disconnection that partners feel around that. Yes, you're absolutely right. And in fact, you know, that those facts led uh, my wife and I to do three studies and we wrote a book called and baby makes three. And, you know, not only did we study couples, but we studied the babies as they developed and the interaction between the parents and the baby. What we found in our first study was that two thirds of couples experienced this big drop in relationship happiness in the first three years of the baby's life. And even videotapes of them discussing an area of disagreement that were scored blind. People didn't know whether they had a baby or not when they scored them. Hostility increased in the first uh, three years of the baby's life. And when we studied their interaction with the baby, you know, which I had to learn how to do. I had to learn how to study parent-baby interaction uh, from my friend Edtronic, who was an expert on it. The hostility transferred to the baby in two-thirds of the couple. So having a baby was a relationship disaster for the majority of couples. But what we did was we studied the one-third who who really did well having a baby, sailing through this transition, and we designed a two-day workshop called Bringing Baby Home. And for 77% of the couples, in two days, we could reverse that drop in relationship satisfaction. We could reverse the hostility. And the babies of the people who took the workshop did better neurologically. They laughed and smiled more, and they learned language, complex language, earlier. So we had a big impact on the baby as well as on the parents. And if we added a support group, that percentage went up to 80% of the parents avoiding that big disaster. Wow. So clearly we're not going to be able to cover everything in a two-day workshop in the next 25 minutes. Uh, but I'm curious, what are, what are some of the highlights there that, that were... Well, you know, we've now trained uh, 2,000 pe- workshop leaders in 24 countries to do this workshop. And it works everywhere on the planet. The same, the same thing works to avoid that disaster. And it's really about, you know, not doing what the couples did in that Sloan Center study. It's really about them maintaining the relationship. And it's not rocket science. You know, it's really, you know, the people we now know from a book called A Normal Bar that studied 70,000 people and studied their sex life, that the people who have a continue to have great romance and passion and great sex, just do different things. There's just about 12 things they do differently. They say, I love you every day and mean it. They kiss their partner passionately for no reason at all. They cuddle. They, they give romantic gifts. They are affectionate in public. They have a weekly date. That's a romantic date. They make sex and love making a priority, but they stay friends. 
you know? And when a baby comes, it's absolutely critical, we found, that fathers be involved with the baby. And the amazing thing is that uh, we men are not good at a lot of things, like reading emotion. I'm not as good as, as women at reading emotion. But we really shine when it comes to play. And so, you know, we're great at playing with babies. Moms are like really responsible, mature teachers of babies. Dads are just like another kid. And we get in there and we really play. And turns out there are over 200 studies done on the role of fathers. And fathers have an enormous contribution to make to the emotional and intellectual development of both sons and daughters. And with our bringing baby home intervention, dads stay involved with baby. And they don't fight with mom. And so, you know, they discuss things constructively and they maintain intimacy. And so those simple things, it's not rocket science, just make a huge amount of difference. Yeah. Is there a, maybe one last thing on that. Is there a simple hint? Because I think for so many couples, it's like, um, you know, you're thrown kind of into the deep end, right? With your, with your child, especially your first child. And, and, you know, time can just go by where they're just absorbing all of your attention. And, and so I'm wondering, how do you help couples who, how do you help them find those moments of reconnection when it seems like there's barely enough time in the day and what time they do have is focused on baby? Yeah, the answer is really that they, they have to be reminded that the greatest gift they can give their baby is a loving relationship between the two of them. And by the way, lesbian couples can use this information that, that developmental psychologists have learned about fathers. And it's, again, not rocket science. You know, uh, if you play with babies a certain way, then you fulfill that role that men fulfill. It's really not biology. It's really behavior and interaction. So I think the important thing is for couples to realize that getting away from the baby, having, you know, an overnight, even if it's in a, you know, Motel 6, you know, and they just, you know, rent a room or they just go on a long drive, you know, just the two of them. And, you know, if they can't afford it, then trade off with another couple. And, you know, in your support group, you know, in your Lamaze class, uh, you know, find another couple and trade off with them. But that time away from the baby, even if you're talking about the baby all the time, but you're really working on your connection with your partner. That's the greatest gift you can give your baby because a loving relationship is the cradle that holds the baby. It is what nurtures the baby's development. So that's what we tell couples. And once they really do that, they have a weekend, you know, weekly date, the romantic date. They work on not fighting, not getting distant, checking in with one another emotionally. It doesn't take an enormous amount of time, but it does take a commitment to keep making love you know, when they can. And, you know, it does decrease for a lot of people when, when a baby comes. But the couples who have a great sex life, even with the baby, are doing very simple things just to maintain their relationship. They're making sex a priority and they're staying friends. Okay, let's talk about that for a moment because I've heard another complaint from couples and clients that, um, I feel like we're, we're friends, but we're not lovers anymore. And, you know, so is there, is there a tension between, um, having great sex and having like too much safety and compatibility in your relationship? Um, absolutely not. Okay. It's not a tension. You know, you can be great friends and great lovers, uh, for a lifetime. And, you know, and that's the thing we've learned about having a great sex life. You know, it's not rocket science. It's just, it's really simple. It's really about touching. It's really about connecting emotionally. And, you know, there's a great book called Come As You Are by Emily Nagoski about sex. And, you know, she says very much like Julie and I say in this book, The Man's Guide to Women, that the first thing that a man needs to realize uh, or a woman who makes love to a woman, a lesbian woman, is that women have a special relationship with fear. 
And they need to know, they, there needs to be three things there to have a great sex life. First of all, they need to not be stressed. So a woman who's got a long to-do list in her head is not going to want to make love. And that's why men who help with housework have a lot more sex than men who don't. <laughs> and second, she has to feel emotionally connected to her partner. And third, it has to be a real explicitly erotic situation, which is why romantic dates are wonderful. And then, you know, sex happens and it, and it continues to be great lovemaking. But people need to really put energy into it. They have to stay friends. They have to say, I love you and mean it. They have to touch. Cuddling is great. You know, this uh, normal bar study found that of all the non-cuddlers, only 6% of them said they had a great sex life. 94% of people who didn't cuddle said their sex life sucked. So it's important to cuddle. There are psychologists who advise their, their clients to not cuddle. And they'll have, you know, better sex if they don't cuddle. It's all, it's bullshit. You know, <laughs> they, they need to go to the library and see what the data say. Everywhere on the planet, it's couples who cuddle and make that a priority, who are affectionate and make that a priority, who say, I love you, who kiss one another for no reason. You know, kissing is the royal road to great sex. But those lips have to feel kissable. You have to want to kiss those lips. And what makes those lips kissable is that you're not fighting all the time. And you're, you're saying, you know, positive things about your partner. You're noticing when they make the bed or make coffee for you or do nice things. You're cherishing what you have and not resenting what's missing. Yeah, a metaphor that I really like is this notion that we're always on this continuum of of exchanging that sexual and sensual energy with our partners. So even those moments where you're making a cup of coffee or just giving a little kiss on the cheek or maybe even a more passionate kiss, along with the cuddling, those are all taking place on this continuum where having passionate sex is on the continuum and also just like brushing your teeth is on the continuum. Yeah, but if you... You know, I, you know, we, we have a, we have a t-shirt a t a t that we sell that has this phrase on it that everything positive you do in a relationship is foreplay. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. It's part of the play. Um, you know, if that's right. Yeah. And, you know, especially I think with some couples where there's all this like pressure around sex, um, if it can all be included, then that can take some of the pressure off of the act itself in some respect. Well, you know, the positive stuff is really important, but the real critical thing is listening to your partner non-defensively when your partner is not very positive, <laughs> you know, when she's pissed off, when, when he's, you know, disappointed, when feelings have gotten hurt, you know, when... You do reach out for one another and it fails because that's just par for the course in relationship. Just because you have two brains that are different, there are going to be moments when it doesn't work. And that's mostly what couples argue about. That's what escalates conflict is when you reach out and you make a bid for connection and it fails. Well, it's going to happen. So the, the cure for that is listening and listening non-defensively. Now, how does this, because um, I'm right there with you, and I'm curious because there are, as you mentioned, other people out there who are promoting this idea of like really the importance of differentiating from your partner to maintain a great, healthy sex life. Um, what have you seen as far as that kind of approach to helping a couple? Well, you know, it depends what you mean by differentiating. The you know, this idea historically comes from the work of a guy named Murray Bowen. And Murray Bowen worked with these really very screwed up families where, you know, they were out of control emotionally. You know, they were escalating conflict. So he became like he thought negative emotions were his enemy. And he wanted to banish anger, wanted to banish sadness. And, you know, I can see why he wanted to do that. 
And he wanted people to stay rational. He wanted everybody to be a Vulcan. But, you know, the great thing about being a Vulcan is you can do a Vulcan mind meld. That's what Murray Bowen missed. You know, so, yeah, you can you can try to stay rational. But the way to stay rational is to listen, because then the emotions don't escalate. They don't escalate to criticism and contempt and defensiveness. They, they don't become destructive. It becomes a way of getting closer to understand what your partner's feeling and understand why and what that's all about. Understanding is the way to make conflict constructive. And that has to precede any kind of problem solving or advice. And so this idea of differentiation, uh, if it means, you know, trying to be unemotional, it's a big mistake. And exactly the opposite is true. But if differentiation means, well, you should be an individual and your partner should be an individual and your differences can enrich the relationship. I'm all for individual individuation, if that's what it means. My wife is a, a mountain climber and, you know, she went to Mount Everest base camp with 10 women. And, you know, I don't do I don't do that. You know, I I won't go anywhere unless I can get room service. So we're very different and it enriches the relationship. So I'm I'm all for individuation, if that's what it means, being different from one another. We're not looking for our clones when we look for a partner to have a lifelong love with. We're looking for people who are really interesting and different from us. That's yeah. what that T-shirt study found. You know, that famous study with the sweaty T-shirts. The the ones where they uh, where people smelled the sweaty T-shirt and could choose who they were attracted to based on that alone. Is that what you're talking about? Right. That's what Klaus Wedekind found was that people, uh, the T-shirts people like are the ones that are the most genetically diverse from them. And particularly in the immune system genes, the major histocompatibility complex genes. We're, what we find pleasant in pheromones are ones that are really different from us genetically. Diversity is what we're looking for. We're not looking for our clone. Yeah, and and it also I'm thinking back on the part of the conversation about trust and commitment and that uh, helping build safety and suppress fear, and that's so important in terms of both partners flourishing, but flourishing in a way that doesn't actually provoke fear in your, in your partner. Yeah, I mean, there's a dialectic between, um, you know, not creating fear in your partner, but also not creating boredom. Right. So, you know, the couples who, whose life deteriorates to this infinitely long to-do list, they're not having any fun. They're not playing with one another. They're not having adventures with one another. They're not continuing to learn together and grow together. And that's a really big mistake. It's really important to connect in these other emotional systems that are so much fun. The reason we get into a relationship in the first place is that we love this person's company, right? We love talking to this person. We love kissing this person. We love going on a long drive with this person. And if you stop doing that in your relationship, you know, and your your relationship deteriorates to tasks and then you start criticizing one another on how they do the tasks. Eventually, you're going to you're going to want to get out of this relationship. It becomes a trap, a burden. So uh, there are two questions competing for my attention right now. So I'll just choose them at, one at random. Um, the first is I'm imagining someone who is in this place of like, okay, things have gotten a little mundane, a little boring, a little routine. Um, and, and maybe we've even deteriorated to the place where we're seeing um, the, uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse as you, as you call them appear in our relationship. What are a couple tips that you offer for someone in that position to get the ship pointed back in the right direction? And obviously, we've already named some on today's show, um, but I'm wondering if others occur to you. Well, I think the, the basic tip is, you know, if you're going to boil it all down to one thing, you've got to adopt the motto, baby, when you're in pain, when you're upset, the world stops and I listen. That's the motto. 
that connects you. That's the motto that makes you say, I'm going to listen to you when you're upset. Even if you're upset at me, even if you think there's something I've done to hurt you, I'm going to listen to you, not yeah. to read what you're saying, but to understand what you're saying compassionately. And that'll get couples on the right track. And I think, but I think that what part of what we're talking about is also, it's a reorienting of priorities, making the relationship important in your life. And if you don't devote time to your relationship, eventually it's going to run down and deteriorate. It's like buying a great car and just never changing the oil, you know, and never maintaining it. Eventually you'll have a wreck on your hands. Same thing with a relationship. That one motto can make a difference, but it takes time to listen. And so, that means, yeah, you turn off the computer, you turn off the cell phone, you turn off the iPad, and you, you make time for one another. And you put your whole heart into that time. I love that. R one rule to rule them all. <laughs> That's right. And, uh, and how about on the flip side? So let's say I'm in a great relationship. Everything's good. And I'm just wondering, like, What's like, what's something that when John Gottman encounters a couple that's doing really well, apart from saying, well, keep doing what you're doing, um, what, what excites you about that possibility? And what, what direction would you point those people in? Like, oh, try now that you're there and you're, you're already great. How do you go to excellent or thriving? And what are some things that, that occur to you along those lines? Well, the secret, Neil, is that there is... You know, we've been talking about friendship and intimacy, and we've been talking about managing conflict. But there's a third system that really is important, and it's the way people build a sense of shared meaning and purpose in their lives. Mm. It's the existential part of life, because the thing about our species that's so magnificent is that we are storytellers. We are meaning makers, and we always want to know what's over that hill. We have a sense of adventure. I mean, think about the fact that, you know, we, you know, we'll, we'll put our bodies above 20,000 pounds of liquid oxygen and set fire to it to go to Mars or the moon. You know, we're adventurous as a species and we create meaning. We adventure by really confronting the fact that all of us are going to die someday. And even four-year-olds are starting to think about what does that mean? You know, who am I? Why am I here? What's the story of my life? And what's the story of our life together? Who are we as a couple, as a family? We too form a multitude. We are a culture and we have, we're meaning makers and storytellers. What is the story of us? What do we want it to be? What do we want it to mean when we sit down and have dinner together? What should it mean when we come back to each other at the end of the day? What should that reunion mean? And Bill Doherty wrote a wonderful book called The Intentional Family, where he talked about how people can create meaning in their lives by really thinking through just simple things like, you know, what's Thanksgiving going to mean? What does it mean to vote today? Mm. You know? What does it mean to choose? And I think this is where the growth happens in a relationship is in creating that Shared meaning and also unshared meaning, individual meaning, and supporting one another's dreams. Um, I didn't want to go to Mount Everest Space Camp with Julie, but I could understand what it meant to her, you know, why Buddhism was important to her. And she spent two years in a Buddhist monastery, why she wanted to trek in Nepal, what mountains meant to her. And it didn't mean the same to me, but I could understand her dreams and support her dreams. And she could understand my dreams and support my dreams. And we could dream together as well. You know, we could, we could raise a baby together. And, you know, she turned out to be this magnificent woman, uh, you know, that we both have this great relationship with. And so we create meaning, we create a family together. And I think if you have a great relationship, you can make that intentional, rather than something that just happens to you. Mm, I love that. I love that. And, and I'm thinking also, I mean, the natural question that comes up are, is something like, well, what about when your dreams are like potentially threaten the relationship, like, and, and that kind of scariness that comes up around that. 
Um, you know, it does happen that one person's dreams are another person's nightmare. And we see that when one person wants to have a child and the other one doesn't want children. Some dreams are irreconcilably different. But at least then a couple knows why they're breaking up. There's a reason why they're breaking up. And they know that they need to find somebody who really supports their dreams and who, with whom they can create a shared meaning system. And uh, so, you know, not all relationships should continue. Uh, some relationships really are not meant to continue because the process of selecting a partner, a lot of it is kind of random. Right, right. And I, I'm reminded of how the first time we spoke, you generously offered uh, the the dreams in conflict exercise for people who are up against this kind of question in their relationship. Um, so with your permission, we'll offer that again to um, people who download the show guide for this episode, um, which you can do if you go to neilsatin.com slash Gottman2, the number two, so G-O-T-T-M-A-N and then the number two, or if you text the word passion to the number 33444 and follow the instructions, uh, I'll send you a link where you can download the show guide to this episode and all of our other episodes. Um, and in our detailed show notes for this episode, we will have everything spelled out that John and I have been talking about, along with links to uh, John's website, his work, the workshops that he mentioned earlier around um, bringing baby home. Uh, John, is there anything else going on right now that's really exciting to you that you'd like to share with the Relationship Alive audience? I think we've covered a lot of the major points, Neil. I'm kind of sad that our uh, time together is coming to an end. It was really fun talking to you. As am I. I'm always, it's always a pleasure to chat with you, John. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Very welcome. Thank you for listening to another episode of Relationship Alive. If you like what you've heard and want to make it easier for other people to find out about us, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and to rate and review us on iTunes. If you have questions or comments or want to continue the conversation, you can always join our Relationship Alive community Facebook group. And for more information about today's episode, visit us online at neilsatin.com slash podcast. Or you can always text the word PASSION, P-A-S-S-I-O-N, to the number 33444 for more information. Finally, do you have a burning question that you're hoping we can have answered here on Relationship Alive? either for a future or past guest, let me know and I'll see what I can do. Take care and see you next time.